talk about the uh, ancient history of Egypt, so we need to know what are the uh, documents or um, uh, the sources or the resources we have to study this history. So actually, I classified these resources into three. The first one uh, is what is left by the ancient Egyptians, including all the writings, all the statues, all tombs, all temples, all monuments, everything left to us by the ancient Egyptians. So after deciphering the hieroglyphs um, from the Rosetta stone, which was found by the French, and uh, Jean-Francois Champollion managed to crack the code in 1822 to be able to read the whole text on the Rosetta Stone in 1824, which is the year we call it the birth of the, the, the Egyptology, what we call Egyptology, was born actually that year when they managed to um, be able to read all the text on uh, the Rosetta Stone and uh, later on everything in terms of that. So this is number one. Number two, uh, the Greek historians. The Greek historians who came to visit Egypt starting uh, around 500 uh, BC. And the most famous name uh, of the Greek historians who wrote about Egypt was Herodotus, who was known as the father of history, and Plutarchus. Uh, Plutarchus actually uh, did a lot to the Egyptian uh, uh, history, and he wrote about mythology in ancient Egypt. Okay, uh, and the third source, are the holy books, mainly the Quran and the Old Testament, not the New Testament, mainly the Quran and the Old Testament. Let's call it the Bible. Okay, so if we try to criticize the, the, the three sources and see how good and how bad they are. So number one, if you talk about the ancient writings of the ancient Egyptians, so we have to be very careful because sometimes they were not telling us the exact story or the truth about the story itself. Sometimes they were exaggerating. Because most of the writing seems to us from the royal family, the kings, and so on, or the elite of the society. So you're trying to show off, even when you go to a tomb, and you see the pictures on, on the walls of a tomb, you don't have to believe it all, because this is how, how they want their life, their second life to be. So they didn't have to have the same thing in the first life, no, but they wish to have this land, or they wish to have that wealth, or whatever. So they have to, uh, we have to be very careful when we deal with them. Also, when we talk about the achievement of the king, you find someone like Ramis II told us, told us lots of stories about his achievement and his victory here and there and so on. But we find now some writings uh, by the other nations who were enemies to Egypt at the time. They, they were telling us a different version of the story. So, so we have to be very careful. Number two, if you talk about the Greek historians, we have to be aware that those Greek historians who came to Egypt like 500 BC, that was a long time after the beginning of the Egyptian civilization. So how come that we believe someone like Herodotus when he wrote about the building of the pyramids and he was that precise about the number of people who worked there, 100,000? Excuse me, how did you know? That was like 2,000 something years before you've been here to Egypt. So where from you got this knowledge? What made you that sure about what you're telling us? So we have to be very careful. Number, number two also, they were not able to speak the, the language of the Egyptians. So maybe it was misunderstanding. If I don't speak English very well and I go to the States, I talk to somebody on the street and maybe he gives me a, a piece of information and I cannot understand it. He's pushing me to go right side and I go left side because I don't understand. I don't speak the language. Yeah? Or he's using slang or whatever. So I don't get it correctly, especially there is always uh, uh, missing in translation, always, when we talk about different languages. So, this is number two. Number three, which is the holy books, the Quran, and uh, the Old Testament of the Bible, we have to be uh, fair and admit that they are, although they are holy books, with all our respect to them, due respect to these books, they are not history books. They are not meant to be like history books to write about the history of whatever country. So they mention some stories happened in Egypt, and we have to deal with these stories from the perspective that we are historians, so we take what we can find it matching the documents we have. But we have to admit that the holy books mentioned the story of Joseph, the man of the coat of many colors, and also uh, Moses. So these are two of the main stories mentioned uh, uh, several times actually in those two books. This is what we are going to talk about uh, uh, today. Uh, it, it has been always a big issue to me, um, the coming of the Israelites and their exodus. Uh, 
course, what happened in between is a big story, but I mean, when did they come to Egypt? When have they arrived to Egypt? And when have they left Egypt? Because the Exodus now, which is actually a big problem, most of the people, they think that the Exodus happened during a specific time, which is the time of Ramesses II. And guess why? You won't believe it. Most of the people living on Earth today, especially non-Egyptians, maybe many of the Egyptians, they, they believe that the Pharaoh of Moses or the Pharaoh of the Exodus was Ramesses II. Why? Simply because of a very famous American movie called The Ten Commandments. This is in the Can you believe this? So that, that, that is the, the, the piece of information they, they have, and they, they are talking about as if it's like, you know, a fact. Right. Uh, this is, I will show you a couple of maps, okay? This is a map of part of Egypt, Sinai, and Canaan land. We believe that the Israelites came from the area which is now called Palestine or Israel around this area, and they were originated in Asia Minor. Uh, the Palestinians, the locals of Palestine and, and uh, later Israel, they originally came from uh, the islands, the Mediterranean islands like Cyprus and Malta, uh, and migrated to uh, uh, this area now known as Palestine. Uh, so they are originated in Asia Minor. And we have to know also a name of another group of people lived in Egypt. Actually, they, they, they ruled Egypt for about 150 to 200 years, more or less, they are known as the Hexus. The Hexus ruled Egypt as foreign rulers, foreign kings, for about, let's say, two centuries. Okay? 150 to 200 years. We're not exactly sure about uh, the time we spent here. Also, the old method of studying Egyptology, I myself studied this in, in college, in university, that the Hexus where a massive military power, they invaded Egypt when Egypt was very weak, okay? Actually, they taught us in university that the Hexus introduced what is now called the chariot, the military uh, uh, chariots. The Egyptians didn't know it, and the Hexus, one of the reasons why they invaded Egypt easily and took over the country because they had, it's like modern, uh, equipments used in, in the world, First World War, for example, or uh, the, the atomic bomb used by the United States in the Second World War. This, these are one of the main reasons why those countries had this achievement either in the First World War or the Second World War. So the Hyksos had the same thing. New invention, new military invention made them, okay? But now, we strongly believe that the story is a fake story. What does it mean, Hyksos? Let's Let's see. Okay, this is another map here. It's showing uh, the journey of Jacob. Jacob uh, was a prophet, was the father of Joseph, the man of the coat of many colors, and uh, he was also a prophet. And he will be named later on by God, as it is mentioned in the Quran, Israel. So the sons of Jacob, the half-brothers of J Joseph, they are forming the tribes of the Israelites. Okay, the story, let's leave the maps now. The story of the, uh, of the coming of the Israelites to Egypt. Okay, the Israelites are named after Israel. And Israel was Jacob, the father of Joseph. Joseph was treated differently by his father. So his half-brothers didn't like it. So what happened to him? They took the brothers, the half-brothers, took Joseph when he was still a child in a hunting trip, and they uh, uh, left him in the desert, in a deserted well, to be found by some travelers. Because uh, if you go back to the map, this is what we call the root of Horus the Elder. And that was the main trade route and military route from Egypt to Asia and back. So of course travelers, merchants, Bedouins are traveling along this route. So they found 
the boy. So they decided to take him, they decided to take the boy to Egypt, where he was sold as a slave. Slavery was, of course, a big issue at that time. So he was adopted, or he was bought by a, a well-off family from the elite of the society, where he was brought up. For a reason or another, we don't know if that family considered him as like adopted child, or considered him as a servant, and then they liked him later on, so they gave him uh, 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 like a different position in the family, or maybe they didn't have children, so they considered him as their own child. We, we don't know, that, that, that issue is not that clear, but all what you know, that Joseph was brought up in Egypt. Okay. Later on, when Joseph will have a higher title in the country, which is believed to be around 2000, 1900 uh, BC. 2900 BC, when Joseph will be like kind of judge. Uh, and that was what we call the Middle Kingdom. The history of Egypt, let's say the pharaonic history, is divided into major periods. Archaic, which are forming the first two uh, uh, dynasties. And then the Old Kingdom, when they were building pyramids like Giza and so on. And then the first intermediate period, or the first dark period, we call it dark, it's like the black hole. Because nothing is coming to us from that period of time. No tombs, no monuments, no writings, no achievement as well. And then the rise again of the kingdom, which is what we call the Middle Kingdom, which didn't last for long, 150 years, and then the fall again, what we call the second intermediate period, which is believed to be the time when the Israelites were here. By the end of the Middle Kingdom, all through the second intermediate period. Who was in charge during the second intermediate period? Those people are called the Hexus. When we translate the word Hexus, we pronounce it Heka Chasut. This is the original way of pronouncing the name in the ancient language. Heka Chasut. What does it mean Heka Chasut? Because the language could be, I mean, the, the word could be read in two different ways. It will give us two different meanings, but amazing that the two different meanings would match. You read it this way, it will give you the meaning of the foreign rulers. Okay, makes sense. They were foreign rulers. They were not Egyptians. They were foreigners, and they ruled Egypt. They ruled Egypt. So the Egyptians called them the foreign rulers. Great. Or the shepherd kings. Why? They were coming, looking for food for their animals. So they were originally shepherds. That's why they called them the shepherd kings. Okay, a very important period of the Egyptian history during the second intermediate period, which is the 21st and the 22nd dynasties. When we studied the area where the tombs were built, we found that some of the kings of the 22nd dynasty, their tombs were built inside or behind the tombs of the 21st dynasty. Who came first? The 21st dynasty came first and ruled. The 22nd dynasty came after. So the, the tomb should be nearer to those who are excavating the site. The explanation by the historians now and the Egyptologists now that uh, it was kind of a co-regency. Like they were swapping the kingship. Like you are from the 21st dynasty, I'm from the 22nd dynasty, so a king from the 21st dynasty will rule this time, and then the next time will be a king from the 22nd, and then back again to the 21st. Why they were classified this way? Because of their origin. Those that The one who classified the dynasties of the royal families ruled Egypt was an Egyptian historian called Manitou, or Manitoun, and he was assigned by Ptolemy II to write the history of Egypt. Ptolemy II was talking about like 300 BC. So how to classify them? He said, okay, those who come from, let's say, Ma'adi, all the kings ruled during that period of time from Ma'adi, we'll, we'll call them the 21st dynasty. Uh, I'm just simplifying all the facts. Okay? Those who come from uh, Zamalek, they are forming the 22nd dynasty. But doesn't mean that they all ruled in order. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is very important because 
that will change most of what we know about the chronology of Egypt, which is mentioned in most of the books. Okay? So this is a picture of the tombs of that period, the 21st and the 22nd dynasty. Okay. We have to understand also that in the Egyptian history, the ancient Egyptians believed in large number of gods. The number could be up to 2,000 gods. But all along, the ancient Egyptians believed in a main god or a supreme god. The difference maybe between the Egyptian religion and uh, uh, the holy religions like uh, Judaism, uh, Judaism uh, Christianity and Islam, that uh, they, they believed in the supreme god, but they believed also in the other secondary gods who were supporting and reporting to the main god. So we find like supreme god, more or less he was like the sun god, regardless of his name, you could call him Ra, uh, Amun, Amun Ra, whatever the name. Okay? And then you have other secondary gods, Osiris, the god of the hereafter, Isis, the goddess of love and beauty, uh, Hathor, uh, the goddess of music and dance, uh, Anubis, the god of mummification, and so on. So each one of them was in charge of something and at the end reporting to the main god. These are some pictures showing the wealth of the ancient Egyptians during uh, the time of the kingship, Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom. We'll come to talk precisely about this later on. We'll talk about the situation of the Jews in Egypt. Okay, this is again some pictures showing the wealth. These are pictures originally from some of the tombs, but these are replicas in uh, the museums, um, uh, British Museum in London and also the Metropolitan Museum in the United States. Uh, most of the Egyptians in the ancient time, what was their job? What is the majority of the workforce in Egypt? Farmers. Farmers. Egypt, we started this in school, that Egypt is an agricultural country. We are not an industrial country. Especially at the time, like 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. Majority were either farmers or builders. But of course, we cannot compare the number of farmers to builders. Okay? Egyptians are not good in trades until today. They are not good businessmen not like Lebanese or Syrians or whatever. They are far better when it comes to this. Some of them were merchants, yes, but the number one, farmers. Most of them lived by the Nile, so they were farming the land, feed their families, feed themselves, and sell what is extra. So, some pictures from the tombs about farming. Okay. Now, I'll show you some pictures of the kings from the Middle Kingdom. Look at the pictures here, look at the statues and the features. And this is for uh, uh, the Middle Kingdom. Uh, this one here actually is in the Metropolitan Museum, while this one is in the British Museum in London. Okay, so this scene is from one of the tombs showing coming of foreigners, foreign people to Egypt. You can easily tell from the style of their beard. The Egyptians didn't grow beards. They used to have false beards. They didn't grow moustache. They used to shave. And let's say more than 90% used to shave their heads as well. So you can hardly find someone with his natural beard. Either bald or wearing a wig or wearing a scarf or a headdress or so. Many of the uh, Egyptologists believe that this, this picture and this one showing the coming of the Israelites between the time of Abraham and uh, uh, Joseph, the family of Jacob, as I said before. This is a map showing uh, Mesopotamia. And as I said at the beginning of my lecture, that we are suspecting that the origin of the Hyksus or the Hekakasut, as well as the Israelites, they came from Asia Minor, but they had problem with food uh, at the time because of the change of climate and change of weather. So they were suffering to support their families with food, 
So they were looking for trading with Egypt. That's why that's why the, the, the brothers of Joseph, when they came to Egypt, and they couldn't recognize him at the beginning, when they came to Egypt, they were invited to come and settle down with their families, which will be forming later on the uh, uh, tribes of uh, Israel. I don't know if we are all aware of the division of Egypt all through history. We have the northern part of Egypt, what we call the Lower Kingdom or the Kingdom of Lower Egypt, and the Upper is the Kingdom of Upper Egypt. Egypt has been always divided into two. Wars who became united at the beginning of the, 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 the Pharaonic history, and then was split again into two, and then was united, and then split into two, and then united, and so on. The common fact about Upper Egypt, maybe until the modern time, except for some exceptions, for a very short period of time, Upper Egypt remains a free land. Invasion, occupation, everything happens in Lower Egypt. So when the Hexus or the Hekah Hasut controlled Egypt, they controlled only the northern part of Egypt. What about the southern part of Egypt? It remained independent. They couldn't control it. And they were wise enough not to control it, otherwise they would lose everything. Okay? So they were settled here in this area, mainly in the delta, in a place now we call it like Tanis. Okay? Sal Hagar and Son al Hagar. This area believed to be where the Hexus had their capital. Okay. When the Hexus came to Egypt, as I said, they came looking for a good place to live, good place to survive. They settled down in the delta. They were welcomed by the Egyptians. The Egyptians are always welcoming foreigners. No problem, you can settle down here, find a job, whatever, no problem. We welcome everybody. So there was no kind of resistance because they were not coming in the form of an army, which is matching what happened with the family of Jacob and Joseph, the Israelites, when they came here, they were welcomed also by the Egyptians and they settled down, find jobs, whatever. When we, when we look at uh, the caste system, of any country, especially like Egypt, you find always the the upper level, which is usually forming like five percent, and uh, the, the 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 lower class, which usually the majority, and then you have the middle class. We measure actually the the, the civilization of a nation according to how big the middle class is. Now, in the modern time, okay, so. As long as you have a wider and a bigger middle class, it means it, it tells you that this country is civilized and stable. But when you have the, 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 the middle class shrinking, so this is a red alarm. You know that there is something wrong will happen. In ancient Egypt, the, the, the lower class was forming the majority, which included the Egyptians, the native Egyptians, and included those newcomers, either Hexus or Israelite, call it whatever you like. So the majority of those who lived in Egypt at the time, maybe up to 70%, were very poor. Maybe they just had something to eat at the end of the day, and that's it. But we still have large number of people in the society forming between 5 and 10%, the upper class, they were controlling everything. Those Hicksus or the Israelites who came to Egypt, some of them were great in trade, because this is what we know until today about those people in that, that origin, Syrians and Lebanese. So they, they made uh, uh, great wealth out of trading, which what happened later on by the time of the Renaissance in Europe. The Italian merchants, when they, they traded with China, they made big wealth. And they use this wealth to do what? To sponsor the scientists, the scientists, mm -hmm. uh, uh, writers, musicians, and so on, which led later on to the Renaissance. The same thing happened here. The merchants, mostly non-Egyptians, made 
big wealth. Okay, but also some of them were very good in military, those who took control of the northern part of Egypt. So now, sit back and look at the society. We have again the caste system, three main categories of the caste system, those on the top of the scale over there, either merchants or politicians or army soldiers and officers. They are controlling everything in the country. They are a mix of Egyptians and non-Egyptians, which means that the king who is sitting upon the throne could be easily an non-Egyptian, but he was accepted by the people in Lower Egypt. What about, what about Upper Egyptians? Uh, the Upper Egyptians are very proud of being natives. We cannot be controlled by the foreigners, but we cannot also defeat them, and we cannot fight them back. So it's a hidden peace treaty between the north and the south. Okay. To live safe in Upper Egypt, we have to pay the foreigners who rule the north part of the country. We have to pay them money. We have to pay them gold. Otherwise, they will come to invade us. Otherwise, they will come to uh, annoy us somehow. Okay. Which will happen sooner or later anyway. This, this kind of peace treaty lasted for a period of time. But it was always like kind of clashes between the two of them. Why? Because the king, the foreign ruler, in, in the northern part of the country, was always claiming that he's the king of the United Kingdom of Upper and Lower Egypt, and he's wearing, putting on the top of his head, the double crown, which is half white and half red. The same day, the same minute, the king in Upper Egypt He's claiming that he's the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, and he's wearing also the double crown. So actually, a matter of fact, you have two kings, each one of them claiming that he's the king of the United Kingdom or the two countries. Now we come to the time of Moses. On our way to talk about the Exodus, we have to talk about Moses. What was mentioned in the Old Testament, what was mentioned in the Quran, almost identical. Maybe the only difference that in, in the Old Testament, when they were talking about, I don't, I don't think that we need to go through the story of finding Moses as a baby uh, after he was put in a basket by his mother and so on. But who found the baby? Who found the baby? There's a difference between Quran and the Old Testament. Excellent. Difference between the Quran and the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it said that the lady who found the baby was the Pharaoh's sister. Okay? In the Quran, it said that the one who found the baby was the Pharaoh's wife. Okay? How come? Who's right, who's wrong? As I'm a Muslim, I believe that the Quran is right. Maybe our Christian believe that the Bible is right. But matter of fact, to me as a historian, both of them are right. Why? Because in ancient Egypt was no difference between wife and sister. Why? Because the pharaohs used to get married to their sisters. So the sister actually could be easily a wife. And the wife could be easily a sister. Why they were doing that? Because they were following the steps of the gods. Maybe the only Egyptians didn't get married to their sisters. But we're talking about royal families. Why? Because the royal families, they were the descendants of the gods. The gods. Did the gods get married to their sisters? Of course. Of course. Osiris and Isis were brother and sister and they got married. And the Pharaoh was representing Horus, the son of Asim Osiris, upon the throne. And then when he's dead, he will become Osiris. So he's actually ruling under the name of Osiris. Osiris is the one who will judge him, either to send him to heaven or to hell. So it was no harm to get married to their sisters. Especially if the king was not the son of a queen. If the crown prince is not a son of a queen, he is the son of a king, but his mother is a secondary wife. So to become the pharaoh, he will need more support. Where from? From getting married to his half-sister, who is the daughter of the queen. You got it? Trying to tell everyone, number one, of course, the priests, very strong, very powerful, that the king and his queen are both children of the gods. 
They're not just me. And they have the same royal uh, blood. Exactly, the same royal blood. Trying to ensure that their children in the future will be more holy than them as well, or more divine than them. So there's no harm if we say Pharaoh's sister or Pharaoh's wife. <laughs> it's, it's ironic. Why? Because until today we find in Egypt many things happening. Uh, used to happen thousands of years in Egypt. Thousands of years. In the countryside, maybe it doesn't, it's not common to hear it in, in, in Cairo or in the big cities. But in the countryside, if you go to the Re countryside, in Upper Egypt especially, you find that the wife is calling her husband in a very intimate moment, Akhuya, Yahuya, which means my brother. When she's talk, nicely sitting together, having a cup of tea in the afternoon, and they would like to talk about something, you know, dear to them or a family or whatever. I'm telling you, Yahuya, I'm telling you, my brother, that's so and so and so. He's not her brother. It's actually the husband. But this is how the wives in the countryside call their husbands until today. Maybe they are not cousins even, or they are not members of the same family, but this is how to show to show how they are intimate to each other. It's kind of tradition. All who say that traditions in Egypt are much more stronger than religion. Okay, so now we know that Moses was found as a baby and was taken by the family of the Pharaoh, was adopted by the, the, the sister or the wife of the Pharaoh. This is a picture just to show that we are still doing more or less the same thing, farming uh, along the Nile, and uh, it's, it's always uh, uh, noticeable when, when you go down the Nile on a Nile cruise or something like this, you, you think that Egypt is, is really green, it's very green. I think that the whole of Egypt is like this, but matter of fact, it's only the narrow strip of uh, green along the river line. Uh, I brought you here two pictures, two st pictures, statues from the British Museum uh, for the Hexus kings. If you remember the pictures of the Middle Kingdom kings, you find how similar the features are. Uh, so, some people, they, they, when they look uh, vaguely uh, at the statues or the, the the carvings or the paintings on the tombs, you think, okay, all Egyptians look the same. We're not Japanese, we're not Chinese. Yes, the common thing is the ideal form that they want to show the king always young, strong, handsome, good looking, and so on. The queens always beautiful, nice bodies, and so on, and young, of course. Okay. But if you look carefully, you find that the features are different. Even when you look at the statues of the 18th dynasty and the statues of the 19th dynasty, we're talking about the same period of time, which is the New Kingdom, the features are different. The features are different. They all look handsome, good looking, young, but they are different. And a very good example, actually, if you go to a place called Memphis, the open museum of Memphis. There is a big statue, alabaster statue of a sphinx in the heart of Memphis. If you read the label, it would tell you that this statue, alabaster statue from the 19th dynasty, this piece of information is being corrected like 15, maybe 20 years ago, but they never changed the label. They, they examined the statue and they realized that the features of the statue do not match the features of the kings of the 19th dynasty, so they are dating it back to the 18th. You see, even a similar period of time, but, but they are different in feature. Now, Moses, what happened to Moses? Moses was brought up in the Pharaoh's house, was adopted somehow, was treated very well by the Pharaoh, we will find here through this story that we don't call the Pharaoh of Moses one Pharaoh, but actually Moses lived during the time of two Pharaohs. He was brought up by one Pharaoh, and the Exodus took place during another Pharaoh. Okay? Could be related, could be a father and son, could be cousins, could be... But now, 
it is very clear that was not just one pharaoh whose wife or sister found the baby and he was the same one when the exodus happened no they were two different persons okay moses committed a crime by killing a guy could be egyptian could be non-egyptian from the foreigners who were living and working here but because he was worried about being punished he ran away flee from the country okay of course went through sinai this is the only way out okay in sinai there is a place very famous historical place i don't know if you've been there or not it's called saint catherine okay what do we have in saint catherine we have a very famous well. Have you been before? Have you been? I'm not allowed to travel there. You haven't been? You can't go. I'm not allowed to. Oh, uh, not allowed to go to Sinai? Yeah. Okay. So, in, inside the monastery, there is a well. It is called Jesrus Well. Jesrus was the father-in-law of Moses. This is where he met two sisters and he decided to get married to one of them who will become Sephra. yeah she will become moses wife okay saint catherine of course is uh, located on uh, mount sinai by the way this is a, from inside the monastery as well which is burning bush. the burning bush okay we come to talk about the burning bush because of course on the way back to Egypt traveling with his family he lived away from Egypt for about like 10 years according to what mentioned in the Quran uh, so coming back to Egypt of course traveling in the desert as Bedouin the most important thing for safety and security is to find the fire so he's looking for fire and halfway through in Sinai he noticed that there is a glimpse of fire on the top of the mountain. So he told his family, stay here, I will go and check. Okay? When he went up there, he found this, the so-called burning bush, uh, burning, where he received the message from God or from Allah to go back to Egypt and to call the Israelites out of Egypt. Okay? Uh, of course, we after explaining the caste system in Egypt at the time, so we realized that the majority of the workers, either farmers or builders or so, will be including the Israelites, not just the Egyptians, but the Israelites. The Israelites, some of them were poor and some of them were rich. We have a very famous story in the Quran, not mentioned in, in the Bible, but this mentioned in the Quran, about a very famous, very wealthy, businessman and a landlord called Karun. His wealth is beyond the imagination and no words can explain how wealthy the guy was. Who is the richest person on earth today? Give me a name. Bill Gates. Bill Gates? Bill Gates is nothing compared to him. This is what the Quran said. And he was an Israelite. Which means that not all the Israelites were persecuted or slaves. No. Many of them, with many of the Egyptians, because that slavery was known at the time. Many of them and many of the Egyptians, or most of them and most of the Egyptians, were very poor and treated badly. Yes. But some of them and some of the Egyptians were very wealthy. Some of them and some of the Egyptians were on the top of the rank. You got it? This is very important. It's, it's not looking at the society as Egyptians and non-Egyptians. No, it didn't work this way. They were mixed. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Moses, when he went back to Egypt, of course, this is like comic uh, pictures or paintings. It's just trying to uh, 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 deliver the message. We know that the meeting with the Pharaoh, uh, uh, I'm calling uh, uh, the Israelites out of Egypt. Who are you? I'm the prophet of God. I am your God, the Pharaoh. Believe that no, he is not the he's not the creator, but he believed that he is 
the representative of the gods. How come that you, Moses, are coming today to tell me that I have a message from God? What God? If there is a message from God, so it has to be through me. Okay? Fine. So, debate. Show me. How come that you have a message from God? So, Moses got his rod, thrown the rod on the floor, turned into a snake. And by the way, that was very common in Egypt. That was very common. Egypt was full of magicians. Great magicians. Maybe the best magicians on earth at the time. Ah, so Moses, you're not a prophet, you're a magician. So if you are a magician, I cannot compete with you, but I will call those who can compete with you. I will call the magicians. You play together, guys. You are magicians, you play together. Okay, fine. And they had the agreement to meet one day when Moses will show his power given by God through his rod and stuff like this. And many of the magicians will convert to follow Moses because they will realize that he's not a magician, he's a prophet of God. Okay. Now we come to the main problem between Moses and the Pharaoh who I believe that he was one of the kings of the Hyksos. Now Moses would like to take the Israelites out of Egypt, which means that he will take the majority of the workforce who are farming, who are building, so out of Egypt. How come? And this is even without the permission of the Pharaoh, without my permission. It's dignity and, and bride. No, I cannot let you do this. Moses will carry on doing it. Of course, the story of Moses crossing the sea may you think that was the Red Sea. Was it the Red Sea? What do you think? Okay. Uh, I want to show you. Okay, Th this is the Red Sea here. Right? What's located here? Arabia. Saudi Arabia? Yeah. Did the Israelites go to Saudi Arabia? No. Okay. Is the Red Sea a small sea? No. In this part it's very wide. If, if you go traveling on a big passenger uh, uh, ship, how long do you need to go to Saudi Arabia to cross the sea? About uh, from the shortest here, this area, it takes one full day of sailing. But if it's further south, like from Hogala to Jeddah, two we're talking about like two to three days. It depends on the speed of the boat. Are we talking about 